to New Horizon College of Engineering uh, for their new IC922 systems based on open power. Uh, today's talk will be focused on the extreme scale scientific software stack. And I'll cover two tools, E4S and Tau. And uh, with this, I would like to pose the problem. The problem is that with growing hardware complexity, it is now getting harder and harder to accurately measure and optimize the performance of our HPC and AI ML workloads. The second problem that we are going to address today is that as our software gets more complex, it is now getting harder to install the tools and libraries correctly in an integrated and interoperable software stack. To address these issues, we present the Tau Performance System, a toolkit that I have been working on for uh, about 25 years now. Tau aims to support all the HPC platforms, compilers, and runtime systems, and provides portable instrumentation, measurement, and analysis capabilities. You have three important stages of Tau, the instrumentation or adding hooks to your code that will then enable the measurement and then generate the profiles and traces that can be analyzed in tools provided by Tau like Paraprof. We support automatic instrumentation of programs written in a variety of different languages spanning Fortran, C++, C, Python, even Chapel and Spark, and support a number of different measurement options across different runtime systems. These include the commonly used runtimes in high-performance computing, including the MPI or message passing interface, as well as OpenSchmem and uh, pthread and OpenMP. We have support for uh, different compilers that support the OpenMP tools interface and also support GPU executions, including NVIDIA's CUDA and uh, support parallel profiling and tracing where we support systems such as uh, uh, IBM IC922 and AC922 systems, which form the basis of Summit and Sierra supercomputers in the US. So in case you're wondering how Tau can help you in your performance engineering goals, and what is it that Tau can show you? Well, it can show you how much time is being spent in different code regions in your application, including routines and outer loops. Within the loops, you can see what is the contribution of each statement and how much time is being spent in OpenMP loops, in kernels executing on GPUs, the, you can measure the data transfer between the host and the GPU. Instead of time, you can substitute it with hardware performance counter data and see exactly how many instructions were executed, floating point instructions, level one, level two data cache misses, hits, branches, vectorization, memory usage of your code. You can measure the high watermark of the memory footprint of your application. And by the memory usage, I mean the stack, the heap, the data, text, and BSS, the elements that make up your process. And you can see what is the max value that is reached on every MPI rank. You can measure the energy usage, the IO characteristics. You can see which files were accessed, how much data was transferred in read and write operations, what was the peak bandwidth, volume, and how does your application scale? You can measure the efficiency, runtime breakdown, across different core counts. But to do that, you need to add hooks to your code. You can do this at the source level, at the compiler level, and also at the runtime level using preloading of Tau's DSOs or dynamic shared objects. 
where a shared library can be preloaded in the execution of your application and it can intercept the MPI calls, it can intercept other types of calls and enable measurements, including event-based sampling. This is a 3D profile browser that ships with Tau. It's called Paraprof. And you can see what every rank is doing, every function, and then what is the shape of the execution. For instance, you could see that this particular function and this function are kind of inverse of each other. You can see that there is one CPU that executes a lot more work than the others in this case. And you can even have crosshairs and see the function and thread. And here you see that this loop on thread 199 takes 129 seconds. You can rotate this in 3D. So there's a large number of runtimes that Tau supports. It supports MPI, pthread, OpenMP, even OpenACC, and other runtimes including CUDA and Cocos and Python. You can also mix and match these runtimes like MPI with OpenMP or Cocos with pthread with MPI or Python with CUDA and MPI. And you can measure the performance of your AI and ML workloads, including TensorFlow, PyTorch, and uh, Horoward, which may use MPI. So the challenge is, how can I port my code effectively and efficiently to diverse and emerging architectures? We know that most people prefer to use MPI for inter-node communication, but within the node, there are many options available to you. One of these options is Cocos. It can be used to get portability and performance, and you can target different backends, including pthread, including OpenMP or CUDA GPUs that you may have. And it represents the X in the MPI plus X. We all talk about MPI plus X as internode communication taking place with MPI and within the node, you have some way of expressing that parallelism that's inherent in your program. So it provides a productive, portable and performant shared lib memory programming model and allows you to express that parallelism using a C++ API, then using aggressive compiler transformations using C++ templates, it transforms that code into backends, which could include OpenMP or pthread or CUDA. And we use the Cocos profiling API in Tau to map the low level performance data to higher level constructs of Lambda functions written in C++ that represent the parallelism. You can learn more about Cocos from the cocos.org site. It's a project from the Sandia National Laboratories in New Mexico in the US. And this is how it looks. You can create regions of your code where you can give a name to a region. You can specify a parallel for operation and even give an optional parameter which specifies what that C++ Lambda function does. For example, here we are using an halo update pack from within the com MPI. And you have different names for the different parallel fors. So you just write your code once at the high level and you don't inject in that source code anything about how it executes. The backend of Cocos will then be targeted using the compiler. And then it will transform this C++ code into a form that executes on the GPU or on the uh, Power9 CPU. And you can pop the region in this way. And when you just run it with Tau, with no modifications to your binary, you can get profile files that show these regions as phases in Tau, where you can see the flat profile within each phase. And you can launch an execution, say on 256 uh, CPUs, using MPI run command like this. And if you take an uninstrumented, unmodified binary, you can just launch it with tau exec and then specify an option like dash kupti a dot out, or you can say tau exec dash IO and it will measure the IO profile or dash OMPT, which stands for the OpenMP tools interface. In that case, every thread of execution that is spawned using the OpenMP a pragma based uh, execution will 
be instrumented using the OpenMP uh, calls and the hooks will be inserted using the OMPT. You can also enable event-based sampling using the EBS option where your program is periodically interrupted and then based on where the samples are collected, you can generate a full profile that represents the total execution time. So with this, you can generate detailed profiles that show in this case on an IBM AC922 system, this is a molecular dynamics code called Kabana MD. It's executing on NVIDIA V100, V100 GPUs on an IBM system. And you can see exactly how much time was spent in individual source lines like this and see the exclusive and inclusive time. You can see the CUDA device synchronization overhead, MPI calls, and you can pretty much take a, a slice through the layers of the runtime and see exactly where the application is spending its time. There are some runtime parameters that can control what kind of performance data you can generate. You can then uh, use these options to vary the event-based sampling period or memory debugging options. But the important thing to take away is you do not need to change your application. You just launch it using tau exec and then generate the performance data and measure where the tau time is being spent. Uh, this is the website of Tau. And uh, with Tau and Cocos, the growing complexity comes into picture. And the problem that we face is that as our software gets more complex, it's getting really hard to install the tools and libraries correctly in an integrated interoperable software stack. We are in the Department of Energy in the US are putting together many different HPC systems. And this is the transition, as you can see, there is the Summit and Sierra systems at Oak Ridge National Labs based on IBM and NVIDIA partnership. And these are currently, Summit is the number two fastest computer in the world uh, located at Oak Ridge in Tennessee in the US. And there are other future systems that use different types of accelerators. Here is the current generation of uh, systems, Summit and Sierra, and then future systems that are planned in the, in the next coming years. But the important point here is that our goal in the software technology in the Exascale computing project is to build a comprehensive coherent software stack that enables application developers to productively develop highly parallel applications that effectively target diverse Exascale architectures. And to do that, we have uh, six technical areas. The first area is the programming models and runtime, the software development kit. And I lead this area uh, for the SDK. There's development tools that features tools such as Tau and Pappy. There are math libraries, which have a range of solvers that are available for you to use. Data and visualization tools, uh, including HDF5, Visit, Paraview. You have the NNSA ST applications and uh, the E4S, that uh, project that I'm a technical lead on, the software ecosystem where we develop and deploy the software stack, uh, it's guided by community policies, which helps improve the software quality. We have a doc portal, which gives us the product information. We have portfolio testing. You can think of E4S as a curated collection of software packages that aims to have better quality documentation, test integration, delivery, build and use, delivering the HPC software to facilities, vendors, agencies, industry, international partners in a completely different way. We have quarterly releases. We just had one in May. We have build caches where we can store binaries for specific compilers and runtime systems that can help speed up your application deployment by as much as 10, 10 times. We have turnkey stacks, e4s.io is our web page, and we have a strategy group for industry, US agencies and international partners. So you can think of e4s as a curated SPAC based software distribution using the SPAC uh, pro program deployment framework. We also have container images that are available on Docker Hub and our e4s web page of pre-built binaries. And we have recipes for creating custom images 
and validation test sweeps. We also have a deployment on cloud-based systems. So you have a collection of applications. There are over 24 applications. You have software technology products, about 70 different products that you may uh, already be using, and then hardware integration to deploy these on the exascale systems in the future. So we work on products, we work on applications, uh, we work on runtime systems, we work on products that the applications need now and also in the future. You may have used uh, MPI, which forms the backbone of HPC applications for internode communication. Uh, there are some new products that you may not be aware of, such as uh, the simple interface to complex memory or SICM or ZFP or Unify checkpoint restart. You have some lesser known products, but they address the key new requirements, including Cocos, Raja, and SPAC. And then there are widely used products such as MPH. We have LLVM compilers, and we are making a lot of uh, new enhancements to LLVM. We have math libraries, sparse solvers. We have IO and data and visualization and performance evaluation tools, including Tau. And we use these products in the form of SDKs, logical groupings that are then deployed in E4S. This is our web page. We have community policies over here that describe exactly how you can become a member in the E4S ecosystem of tools. And uh, we have uh, many different releases, including uh, a new release with uh, uh, May 2021. But you can think of E4S as a community effort, a community effort to provide open source software packages for developing, deploying, and running scientific applications. We also have a modular interoperable and deployable software stack based on the SPAC package manager. And we enable uniform APIs where possible. You have many different uh, product categories, but SPAC forms the basis for deploying the software. It's a package manager for software delivery. It allows you to specify versions of different packages that are interoperable or not. And each package has its own recipe that tells SPAC how it should be installed and what are the steps for building and running uh, the test cases. You can find out more information at spac.io. And the reason we use SPAC is that scientific software is becoming extremely complex. This is the dependency tree of NALU, a generalized unstructured massively parallel low Mach flow system for uh, turbine simulation. So you can see wind turbine simulation and you can see that there's a number of different packages here. This is the tree for deal to a finite element library. This is the tree of dependencies for R minor. So you can see that it's becoming unsustainable to target such large complex builds with just building one package at a time. And even proprietary codes such as Aries use a number of different open source libraries shown in blue. So we are developing over 15 applications with 80 different software packages for different target platforms, compilers, and programming models with multiple versions of these packages, which leads to a combinatorial explosion. So we need to tame the complexity of build process. And it's becoming so unsustainable that many centers are using many uh, full-time equivalents to build and port the applications. So how do we install software on a supercomputer? First, you download all the 16 tarballs, you start building, you then configure each package, you fight with the compiler, you make, you tweak configuration args, you configure, make, make install. And when it's all done, you get a binary When you run the code, it can seg fault, and then you start all over again. And this is really frustrating to developers when you are trying to deploy packages on a system. Well, you may ask, what about modules? Well, modules don't handle installation. They just set paths that somebody else has already installed and uh, someone else has to do the installation. To solve that problem, we support the SPAC package manager. You can just do a Git clone, 
source the setup file, and then you can just say spac install tau, which will install tau and all its dependencies. I recommend that you also find the compilers and external packages before doing the tau install, but you can now specify a version. You can specify the compiler and the compiler version. You can specify additional build options such as MPI, Python, pthreads, and even configuration parameters for the different packages such as please use mvaph2 when you're configuring this tau package with MPI. And then with this, you have on this PPC 64 LE, a number of different packages. In fact, we support 319 packages installed this way in a container environment. So you don't have to install all this uh, set of packages. You can just install one package called Singularity and then download a container and then you'll automatically get access to all of these tools and libraries that then you can use. So it simplifies the installation of HPC software you can learn more about it at this web page. We use this to develop the SDKs, which is logical grouping of products, such as Tau, Pappy in the tools and technology. And then we can create bare metal installs as well as custom container builds for different architectures. You can just download a Singularity file. You can go to Docker Hub and pull in a container. This is for the IBM PPC 64 LE which automatically gets you 67 different E4S products that are shown over here. You can see all of these products like Amrex, HDFI, Cocos, MFEM, MPitch, and so on that you can get from a single container that you can launch with the dash dash NV flag for NVIDIA V100 GPUs. It has support for GPUs. As you can see, TensorFlow, PyTorch, NumPy, all of those Python packages are pre-installed in that Singularity container that you can download. You can also get base images on Docker Hub and multi-platform E4S Docker recipes that show you how to create your own containers. We have a large number of tutorials that we have posted on the E4S webpage. I would recommend that you see those. And then you can also create Docker recipes in this manner for IBM and uh, Red Hat, for instance. You have a full recipe of how to install different products. You can install them on bare metal like this with an environment of SPAC or create a Docker container and customize the container to just what you need from our base images. You can also build, get uh, data and uh, binaries from the build cache where we have cached binaries of various packages. We have over 50,000 spec packages in binary form. And you can just pull in a E4S in this manner in WDM app, which uh, does the whole device modeling uh, for the ITER uh, fusion reactor. You can see how E4S is used or on the Los Alamos National Labs Pantheon project, which runs on Summit, you can see the data and visualization provided by Ascent, and they have reported a 10x speed up with using E4S. But it's not just enough to package the software. You also need to validate and ensure that it does what you expect it to do. So we have a number of different validation tests over here that are used to create the base images for containers. And we have GitLab runner images, so you can have continuous integration and continuous deployment. This is how we use GitLab at the University of Oregon with different pipelines for different operating systems. And uh, this is at NERSC at uh, Berkeley Lab at the, in the University of California, Berkeley. And this is the build pipeline. This is at Oak Ridge National Labs. And we have a doc portal that provides a single online location for different products that are included in ECP. So you can see the names of products like Adios 2 or Archer, and you can then search for different products and then uh, get access to the information about the document. We go out to the GitHub sites and rake the data every night. So you get fresh information about these products and what uh, features are available. If you are starting out and teaching uh, container concepts, I would encourage you to download a virtual box image from E4S which includes different container runtimes like Docker, 
and Singularity, you can run this on your laptop. You can also use a tool called E4S Container Launch or E4S CL to simplify the launch of MPI jobs where you can replace an MPI library in the application with the system MPI so that you could then replace the MPI and use the full power of the HPC's hardware. And there you can initialize the container launch tool and then launch the MPI executions in this manner. It's also available from our web page, and this is the architecture of this. So in summary, I would like to say that E4S is not a closed system that's only DOE centric, but an extensible open architecture, which accepts contributions from US and international teams. And you can think of it as a framework for collaborative open source product development and integration. The tools that we feature are all available in an MIT license, they are all free. You can download this. And best of all, you don't have to struggle so much in installing the software stack. You can just get one file and then you will have the complete software stack from DOE available on your computer systems, on IBM systems in your lab to use. It's a full collection of compatible software, a vehicle for delivering high quality reusable software and really a conduit, a conduit for future leading edge HPC software. The work on E4S is carried out at the Performance Research Laboratory at the University of Oregon. I direct the Performance Research Laboratory here at UO in Eugene. We are located on the west coast of the US and it's a very pleasant uh, city to visit. I would like to thank various uh, contributions from uh, uh, support organizations, including Department of Energy, Argonne, uh, Lawrence Berkeley uh, National Labs, Lawrence Livermore, Los Alamos, Sandia, PNNL, Oak Ridge, Department of Defense, uh, the National Science Foundation, NASA, CEA in France, and our partners at various sites. I would like to thank the Exascale Computing Project that uh, is funding the E4S project and I'll take any uh, questions at this stage. Thank you. If you would like to see the slides, the slides are available at this web page. I just put it in the chat window. Thank you, Samir, uh, for the uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, panelist, any questions for Samir? Hi, Samir. It's a, a very nice talk. So uh, just I have a question. Uh, it's for... Uh, yes. Uh, see, as a theorist, we actually, when we talk about the performance, we talk about the models and all those things. How do you see uh, actually uh, the future of uh, uh, models with respect to uh, uh, HPC? Because... The performance it, models do... To Sorry? form the basis for any of our work in experimental computer science, it's very important. I yes. see those models becoming more complex with the use of accelerators and uh, to account for on node parallelism, which is getting uh, uh, significant now. The network uh, models are also getting more complicated with uh, DPUs that are now available where you can offload the communication work in some cases, right to the data processing unit integrated on the InfiniBand hardware. And also uh, you have protocols like Sharp that uh, allow for collective operations to be offloaded to the network. So the CPU can be relieved of, the, of that work. These models become more complex when you are doing data transfers from one GPU memory to another GPU memory, which may be on the same node or on a different node and it's done through RDMA protocols. So uh, those performance models that, uh, that highlight the performance artifacts are getting more and more complex as our software becomes, you know, uh, software and hardware architectures become more complex. Did I answer your question, Professor? Yes, Arjunan? definitely. Uh, because uh, uh, most of us, uh, we have seen the work with respect to modeling would actually uh, 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 stop at uh, uh, MMQs. So when we talk about queue modeling and all those things, the traffic that we consider is 
uh, the, the distributions we consider are more generic now. That complexity is also tough. Uh, it's, it's becoming hard because hardly we get a bound there. The, even the bound what we get uh, is not uh, uh, really <clears throat> tight. In fact, we have to we we resort into few things to uh, reduce that uh, to make it tighter. But uh, I was very curious how we actually typically see in uh, uh, HPC because uh, uh, HPC, as you told, right, it, it has a lot of components and then the interaction plays a major role. And uh, uh, we need to come up with some kind of uh, uh, innovative mechanism so that we can actually capture those things and integrate with the existing uh, model, something like that. Yeah. Absolutely. So you can just download our E4S distribution and launch it on an IBM system like this, and you will have the full power of using uh, AI and ML models with the software stack. You can, also use, uh, you can also use uh, you know, the TensorFlow and you can see that it accesses the V100 GPU on the Maybe device. we can stand here and open the video. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Okay. Uh, Samir, uh, uh, Samir and the audience, uh, I'm a panelist. I have uh, the principal of New Horizon College uh, uh, here with me. Yes. And he wants to, he wants to say a few words. Uh, of course. Principal, uh, Mr. Manjunath. Hello, dear participant and uh, my dear colleagues. My dear colleagues. Today, I'm very happy to be part of this uh, webinar. And also, I'm so happy. Today, we have inaugurated our IBM lab in our campus. And uh, this particularly, that MOU, it is going to be with us for next uh, couple of years. We are going to introduce a new course. And also, we give students not only to exposure to the lab, but also we wanted to give hands-on experience to them. And my dear students who are all actually participating this webinar, my one piece of advice is, now in industry, majority of the uh, companies, they're uh, going for the new technology, new innovation. For that, definitely all of you have to work in the lab, not just by reading the theory, so please expose yourself for the hands-on experience. And I thank uh, Dr. Ganeshan for providing me opportunity to speak to all of you. And also he helped us to open this industry lab in our campus. Thank you one and all. All the best. Good luck, sir. Thank you, sir. Hearty congratulations to all of you. It's indeed thank a you, great event. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, any uh, panelists, any other questions? Any other questions for principal here? And also, uh, you know, the, Dr. Samir and uh, uh, the open power technology. Any questions? Or you can always, you know, uh, put it in the chat window also. This okay, is let's Gopal. This is Gopal from Anna University, Chennai. A quick question for uh, Samir. Yes. The idea of either sequentially or parallelly trying to mimic the human brain is an old one. We have been trying to emulate that. Somewhere in the procedure, we got stuck with a square, which is moving into a tube and a hypercube. The base model for our parallel processing, which aligns with the way we think, appears to be Q. One of our other participants has also been remarking on that. We somehow got stuck with that cube model and moving to the actual power of circles or curves is a difficult task. Moving the same model to the circles, it's almost the case of circling the square and squaring the circle. So that is a degree of difficulty we have in migrating to a more natural computational thinking. Your comment. So I agree getting efficient performance, uh, efficient execution on 
future systems is a challenging task. Tools can help with that task as you explore the different topologies, as you explore the topologies of inter-process communication and mapping of those processes to hardware and express parallelism both at the intra-node level and the inter-node level. And uh, tools such as Tau can help you identify how much time is being spent or wasted in the computation. So whatever the model uh, you are exploring, it helps to have tools that can explain what uh, the level of performance is and how you can try and modify that to optimize your execution. That's nice. Thank you. It's still a difficult challenge to move out of Absolutely. This. It's a very daunting task. Very daunting it's task. It's not easy. <laughs> nice. Good. Thanks. Very happy that this got inaugurated. Thank you, Professor Gopal. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the wonderful question. And um, uh, thank you for the answer also from Samir. Thank you. Any more questions before we move on to the second talk? Okay, I think with this, you know, I'd like to thank again uh, Samir uh, for the presentation and also uh, his time is right now 10.30 p.m. PST and it's too late for him actually, you know, and he, 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 he has to, uh, you know, uh, move on and, you know, go to, go to bed. Thank you, Samir, uh, for the... Thank you for, for inviting me and really? congratulations again. Yeah. Bye. Yeah, and also I have I have another uh, call, you know the staff I mean uh, the placement officer as well as uh, leader here from New Horizon who is behind this you know setup completely like you know for the last six months he has been working hard with me on this. Uh, his name is uh, Dr. Binod. Binod, you want to say a few words? Yeah. Uh, very good morning to panelists and participant, my students. This is Professor Binod Kumar Singh. I am heading Industry Institute's collaboration and I take care of placement also. I am elated and very very happy to inaugurate this lab today. And I want to thank uh, uh, Mr. Ganesh also for uh, putting so much effort to uh, help the students to get all this knowledge and to start this lab. I am very, 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 I am very, very thankful to those panels and uh, those speakers from US and Europe who took time and delivered such a nice lecture on that uh, technology. I, I hope uh, this is going to help so much to our students and our whole of the students and faculty will be benefited of this. So many, many thanks from my bottom of heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Binod, and thank you, Samir. Okay, uh, uh, folks, uh, uh, let's move on to the, uh, you know, the second uh, session here. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Florin Manila, who is the uh, IBM AI leader uh, in Europe. Uh, and also uh, he has been working on, you know, the IBM power system and also various, uh, uh, you know, the customer related uh, uh, architecture, uh, you know, and the uh, implementation for AI for the, se for the last several years. And Florin, uh, please go ahead and start your presentation. Thank you, Ganeshan. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I will try to um, present today the, the state of AI and, and where those things will go um, and you know what you can do today on the software stack uh, with the system you have and some challenges that typically we see there. Let me just try this here. <clears throat> Um, so uh, this is something interesting I want to start is the, the cycle for the artificial intelligence this is coming from Garden uh, on, uh, last year, um, where we see a couple of interesting things like deep neural uh, network ASICs, edge AI, those are in, into the peak of inflection expectation. But what is interesting here is that today, you know, the GPU accelerators, um, uh, the machine learning, we know what uh, what we can do with them. We, we know their limits. We know how we can actually run the production on top of them, right? So it's not that big unknown how we can move forward uh, from a lab, from R&D into the industry. So that is a big, big uh, takeaway that uh, machine learning and you know deep learning and uh, those kind of new forms of doing analytics is something that is scaling and is going into production. Um, moving forward, one of the things that we, we deal with today is the fact that um, training those uh, machine learning models in, in AI, you need a lot of uh, data. 
um, and particularly because we try in general either to do uh, um, supervised learning or even if you do unsupervised learning, you need even more data for that. Um, but as we, we add more data into a system like this, you need to compute more. So that, that's something which is not really scaling well in general. And what we, we want to achieve in the future is to actually have neural nets, um, um, artificial neural networks that will consume less data and therefore we're going to consume less computing power either by having different forms of computing or um, different type of algorithms um, from what we know today, right? Um, and I will explain in a while as well what's, what's happening down there. Um, Another thing uh, we need to be aware of are the, the steps um, that in general we are taking um, into the machine learning and deep learning, right? So in the, in the research, in the R&D, we are typically trying to um, find new algorithms that can solve various problems. And therefore that is always you need to try and try and try and until you find a very good algorithm to implement. But then, you know, when you try to, you know, find the proper data sets you need to actually uh, understand, you know, from where you can get your data, how you can clean this data, and then, you know, have the time to train, find the hyperparameters. That is typically um, going into the industry, but partially into the um, academia as well. But then there is something emerging by, you know, when you want to move from, you know, train model to the, you know, to the production, um, it's called quantization or pruning, for example, and pruning, for example. So um, um, those um, those techniques that will actually make the model to perform better when we, we want to run the inference, the, the prediction, whatever that will be, you know, on the edge device, on a near edge server, and so on and so forth. And today there's a lot of research in this quantization and pruning uh, uh, side as the way we serve those models in the future. Um, just just to, to remember. Uh, some concerns is the memory consumption, uh, and you will probably will see on, on the systems that you have uh, there um, during you know, the, the training um, or the inference, how much memory you use, how um, um, that you are bound or the, of the, uh, based on the models that you want to use by the, the GPU memory um, and, and so on and so forth. Then we have the training and inference time, power consumption always, it's a problem. And you have to understand it's not like you know, how much power I will consume by training a model, but how much power I will actually put into the cooling of the system, uh, which is another factor. Uh, the time spent in the data ingestion, right? So we see customers that they have um, uh, a one petabyte of, of data, two petabytes, and they have huge problem in, you know, processing this or customers that they have um, uh, around 10 gigabytes of data and they still have a, a problem because the libraries that they use, they use a single thread. Uh, so there's a serial processing, right? And then obviously the air governance and ethics, which is moving forward when we want to do production. Um, so those are some concerns moving forward. Now, here is uh, quite an interesting thing I try to bring here. <clears throat> it's the evolution of the convolution neural networks in the computer vision, right? So from 2012, uh, uh, we had um, various models there like AlexNet, um, uh, ZFNet, with around uh, 50 millions of parameters. And those that were really growing and becoming bigger, bigger by, you know, uh, 2018, uh, when we had the mobile net, for example, uh, V2.1, uh, with around you know uh, um, 150 uh, to 300 uh, millions of parameters, and therefore we need to add uh, you know more kind of computing side. And then we had the, the NAS family, um, which were you know better and better. So all those things are improving over the time, which is interesting to see as a progression. Um, in algorithms, not in the computing, right? Um, so better models, more hyperparameters, um, and, and that's, that's something interesting to see. Now, uh, with the regards of the efficient nets, uh, which have uh, been around, uh, I think, uh, two years now, um, um, the, um, the architecture for the computer vision has, grow, has, has grown. Because what we see is that if we, we have better algorithms, we can do more with less computing power. So you can see here, for example, uh, the efficiency of, uh, of a B5 or B, B3, which is 
similar with the efficient of ResNet uh, 101 uh, um, or exception sometimes, right? Um, on the same, uh, on, on the lower number of uh, parameters, uh, low number of uh, flops needed to train those models. Uh, that proves one thing, we need to rethink, and I think this uh, I will refer to uh, Professor Gupal who said, you know, okay, we need to rethink the way we do right now the AI. Um, because in general, we, we believe that we started with all this uh, neural nets there, and we believe that we need more GPUs and move forward and move forward. But in fact, we need to rethink the way we create those algorithms for the future. So that, that's something proven. In April uh, this year, we had the efficient net version two coming um, as, as models, which are better than the previous efficient nets, right? Um, and you can see here uh, the, the training time, uh, this was done on the TPUs, um, but you can get them in implemented on, on every harder level, uh, on every harder type, <clears throat> as well as the accuracy um, uh, gain. Um, and what they have done in this case is the, they say, okay, can we do something so we can um, have something called progressive learning? So in the early training epochs, we train the network with small image size and then well, weak regularization, right? So the drop ups and that augmentation that can be uh, inserted there. So then, you know, you have a gradually increased image size and add that dynamic adjustment regularization. So the network will learn much faster. So here is a more technique of, you know, what you can do in handling the, the data when you pass it through a network. Uh, and that proves that you can still improve the performance of the network while you can use less resources, less computational resources. And I think this trend will, 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 will go for the next couple of years as we understand how those neural networks are working. Obviously there are bigger ones like, for example, uh, um, uh, GPT-3 you know, um, where you have in the range of 27 billions of parameters. So still a lot of improvements there as well. But I will refer this to the computer vision here because I have later on some use cases for the healthcare. Um, so that's something which is interesting to see um, and as an evolution in, in this side. And therefore we have to rethink you know, here how this will shape in the future, the computing part. If we have a change in the algorithms, in the way we process the data and the, the way we train those algorithms and so on and so forth. Um, so coming back, um, it's always a problem of, you know, data, always a problem of the algorithms and the, the, uh, the systems where you need to train them. And at the end, um, because we don't want to, to keep this only in the research, only on the university, we want to get this out uh, in the pr production, in, in, in the industry, we need to run the inference somewhere. And, and we see kind of uh, three different uh, problems. Um, with um, um, three different uh, aspects and patterns that in general, you need to tackle um, from many perspective, right? Uh, for example, if you say, hey, you know, I do have a lot of data and I first I need to clean that and so on. So for most probably you will not have uh, a GPU accelerated software uh, that will help you on that. And therefore you still need to use the traditional way of doing and you need to parallelize the, the workloads across multiple CPUs when you process massive data, for example, in joint table and so on and so forth, assuming uh, you use it um, semi-structured uh, data sets. Um, in addition, we see on the inference side, um, other kind of things, right? You, on the inference, when you serve those models, you need to serve them with lower latency, right? So when someone is doing a query, hey, you know, predict this image, you need to get an answer in a couple of, you know, one second or milliseconds back. While on the training is more like a batch process. So you send something and you wait a couple of weeks or, um, or, or days or hours to get back the result, there is no problem. So there are two different types uh, here of, of the patterns that we typically see. Plus the scalability, when you actually run a training, um, you will always say, well, you know, if something goes wrong with the system, I will restart my train from my last checkpoints. That's fine. But in the moment you say, well, you know, I have this model in the production, I'm serving right now a couple of use cases uh, based on that system. If that model will not be able uh, to be still run on the system for some reasons, 
uh, or doesn't have the, the requested, um, uh, let's say, uh, um, uh, response time, will not be able to serve in the productions and business cases that were it was meant for that. As, therefore, we have other kind of problems there like scalability, distribution, and so on and so forth. So um, what IBM um, um, has done was, okay, we need to have kind of three type of systems based on open power, on a, uh, which is the IC922, I think you have it already uh, there, that can be used for the data. And if you add the accelerators inside, can be used for inference, but as well for the training. But in general, it can be used for inference with, with highly efficient way. Um, and the IBM Power AC922, right? So for AC922, we typically use the NVIDIA uh, V100 um, GPUs with 32 gigawatts of uh, HBM2, um, for two, four, or six of them. Um, um, both system AC922 or IC922, they use the Power9 processor technology that um, well, we typically we deliver those systems with um, 20 cores, each processor, so 40 cores per system with SMT4, you will see on your system, if you are looking right now around 160 uh, cores on the system. Um, the powerful of this system is not really the, the, the GPU, right? The, the GPU is there, you can find it in other systems as well, but is more important how you connect this, the GPU to the processor. So in the case of AC922, we use the NVLink connectivity. We don't use the PCIe Express. Um, and in addition, we have in the system um, TDR4 memory um, on eight channels. So we can deliver around 170 uh, gigabytes per second per socket or for around 340 uh, in the whole system memory throughput uh, to processors. Why this is important? Because in general, we, everything has to happen into the memory of the system. If you, even if you have a GPU, right? When you have a GPU, you can put uh, inside of the GPU uh, um, uh, data and, and uh, data and, and the model, as long as the GPU memory will not be filled. I know up to 32, up to 16 and so on and so forth. But you always need to prepare the data for it to have like a post inference and, and processes. And, and sometimes maybe you have larger models that cannot fit into the GPU memory. And therefore uh, a more IO uh, rich system will always help in such cases. Um, in addition to this on AC922, we use the NVIDIA T4 GPUs up to six of them on a, on a single system. Uh, they can be used as well for processing the video, they are, um, they are very efficient. They consume, uh, I think, 75 watts compared with the uh, NVIDIA V100, where we have around 350 watts uh, per, per GPU. So they're very efficient in operation and therefore in cooling as well. Um, all the systems here, they have open power. So the BMC is there, um, very simple to manage supporting various operating system. Um, but yeah, in general, we do prefer to have a um, uh, Red Hat operating system into those uh, systems because we can serve them a little bit better. Um, so um, that's something I want to go for. This is, uh, this is a, a, um, a pod, uh, a system pod, for example, it's just an example. We have uh, a single pod right now, um, but it's just an example of the uh, pod from, we have it on Satori at MIT where we can couple 16 of those systems or even uh, more if, if you have uh, the, the required cooling there. And in these cases, you know, we can have 16 AC922, uh, each one with four cores, SMT4, one terabyte of RAM, we have in that case, four V100, infinite band and NVMe locally um, to you know, accelerate the storage. Um, so um, you can actually form a pod and then you can multiply this pod uh, while you are working for a bigger problem. Um, and then um, you, you will expect some results, right? So the question is, you know, yeah, I have a single system. I will try to optimize and do all my work. But in the moment I will, I'm thinking to go on multiple systems. The question typically is coming, you say, hey, you no, know, maybe I need a system with eight GPUs on it or 16 or something like that. But what we found out is that, you know, when you try to scale from, and you see here the, the performance um, in images per second, uh, while uh, this was done by me in, uh, in TensorFlow on the ResNet 50, 
um, while you are scaling from, you know, 8 V100 GPUs to 16 to 32 to 64 V100, so um, uh, uh, in incremental of, um, of uh, uh, four GPUs in, uh, on every system, the performance tends to stay, to be stable and grow with the systems on a, on a 97% um, um, uh, improvement rate uh, while adding a new system, right? So it's like a step approach. But as you add more system, typically you actually consume more power. And you see here, you know, when you try to process, you know, 55,000 images per second with 64 V100 systems, you will consume each 20,000 uh, watts. Um, and therefore, this has to be really understood, you know, when we really understand and we really scale the implication of the algorithms that we use, the, the systems that we have to serve such, such things that not only can sustain the workload, but they have to really, you know, help the organization to keep the cost down of operating um, and, and, and have a kind of a step approach uh, moving forward. Um, so that's something um, we learn, and I think anyone that has experience at scale of all, this, all of these things, it's always a combination, and uh, you have to understand the implication of it. Um, in terms of the software, you may wonder, hey, you know, um, you know, I, I have access today on, on this beautiful system, um, and you know, I want to run, for example, a, a machine learning thing. Um, we do have something called open cognitive environment. Um, there, is a, there is a channel, a conduct channel. I had it here, open CMIT edu, but um, there is another way to do it. And in this, uh, and, and this um, um, software stack, um, you have the latest version of TensorFlow 2.4.2. Uh, 2. Uh, you have the PyTorch 1.7, also all those things, Transformers, Torch Vision, Torch Tech, Spicy, Dali, Open Neural Network Exchange Format, uh, if you want them to export them. Uh, for scaling this, even on a single system, sometimes it's good to use Horvod. Um, so we do support that and it's, 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 built, it's built there. And in general, as you use accelerators, you, you, um, you need to have the support for the, the CUDA primitives and uh, the uh, NCCL, therefore, and you know, automatically we 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 can actually ship this from uh, from the channel uh, there, and uh, we have on the right side the TensorFlow serving server. Um, so, assuming let's say you want to say, hey, you know, I train this model, then I want to expose this model and have an API that you know, an application of mobile or something will connect and will just do a couple of queries um, to run the inference. Um, so that's very simple to, to be consumed. You just, you know, install your Conda or uh, mini Conda on, on the system on your profile. Then uh, you just say, you know, a Conda search, and then you search to the channel minus C, and then you put open MIT Edu, and you can get this uh, um, uh, very simple uh, on, on your system. And then with the install from the, this, so we we'll just have to get uh, to internet connection. Um, another way, if you want to explore it for yourself and maybe improve it with some other things, you go to the github.com open uh, minus CE um, and um, there uh, you will find all the sources, all the scripts that uh, can be used to build all the TensorFlow, Python stacks, all the software stack I showed you prior, uh, prior to this. Um, but you will need to have some people with some development skills there that will, you know, we will try to package this, create a private channel, keep it on the local drive, and then, you know, just serve the users. Um, but, and, and this is, this is another way of doing, so it's a, it's an option you have right now. And, and I think that that's something that will open your mind so you can explore more than, you know, what other people are giving to you. Um, Right, so one of the question I always have when you look on, you know, what's going on on the algorithm side, uh, what's going on on the computing side, you know, how we move forward from now, right? So um, if, if we have those tremendous kind of technology on the horizon, you know, how we can really, you know, think forward in creating the more models or maybe run only on the CPUs if we can in the future having better algorithms. Um, so um, there are a couple of things that I try to add here as innovation happening, but there are more than this, I, I am, I'm pretty sure. 
For example, there are new ways of representation, uh, representing the numbers like uh, brain floating 16, um, where uh, you see as well, this is implemented. For example, we have NVIDIA tensor floating 32, TF32 uh, presenting the GPUs, AMD FP24 format for AMD processors. So every vendor is trying right now to have new ways of representing the numbers that have to be more efficient um, in, you know, uh, in, in, in such, such regards. Then we have the artificial neural networks um, that are improving uh, more and more. We have a new form of uh, neural nets called spiking neural networks um, that you know uh, tends to mimic the human brain. So you compute into the memory, not in the CPU. Uh, then we have the transfer learning where we see more activity around standardization, runtime, uh, I was mentioning Onyx, for example. Uh, but as well the, the quantization and pruning and around um, um, uh, machine learning operation for standardization, pipeline automation, monitoring and, and audit. Um, in a way of representing the numbers I added here, most probably, you know, uh, we typically use FP16 when you train uh, those models. Uh, and when you, we try to run the inference in eight or in four, uh, but with B16, uh, we actually try to run much more efficient uh, right now. So we see uh, the implementation of the BF16 in uh, more modern hardware processors and accelerators, uh, frameworks like TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, libraries. Uh, you see here a couple of them. And obviously, more important are the compilers. Um, so this is coming. And um, uh, so I think that there is a lot of... Um, innovation from, from many, many, many sides. Um, from the IBM perspective, uh, we are working um, to bring Power 10 processor um, where we are aiming for one terabyte per second throughput per socket. Um, and, and that is by using a um, special memory called OMI memory. Um, we have something called Cofinus Flow and, and we will do support uh, as well operations like, you know, uh, brain floating point uh, and um, uh, int, uh, for example, eight or, or four uh, into this um, processor in the future. Um, so that will be kind of, you know, um, Power ESA 3.1 um, uh, with new kind of uh, matrix to matrix architecture uh, that will introduce new set of instructions to support dense matrix math operation along with the um, required uh, changes in the register handling and management. Um, and uh, in general, those matrix uh, multiply assistant in, uh, instructions lead to very efficient implementation for very, um, I would say for key algorithms uh, in technical computing, machine learning, deep learning, um, and uh, business analytics in, uh, in a natural match for implementing dense numerical linear algebra computational. So that's something we aim for, uh, for the next generation of uh, the power processors. Um, so here is some performance gain uh, simulated by, by our labs <clears throat> uh, compared with the uh, a current Power9 baseline processor and how where we aim for uh, Power10 with Limpact, with uh, Inference uh, for FP32, you see here, or BF16. So you see here the jump, uh, the jump in performance when you use the brain floating point, right? That, that's something um, we see and that we, we believe it uh, will be a massive improvement by just switching to brain floating point. Uh, when you run inference or if you want to do some training. <clears throat> um, so that's that's something we plan to to bring, right? Um, I will start closing with some couple of examples uh, in, in the healthcare, um, but there are many examples of applying machine learning and deep learning in all the industries. Um, so one of the question always was, you know, how we can benefit of deep learning in the healthcare. Um, and I added here a couple of things like, you know, accurate um, uh, automated diagnosis suggestion you can have. Um, you want to reduce the cost, um, prevent reporting delays about critical and urgent cases, reduce the admin load on the healthcare professional, for example, for especially if you think on triage. 
Um, we want to decrease the errors in diagnostic or maybe reach corners in the country where, you know, they don't have well-trained doctors and they need some remote assistance or some form of um, devices or algorithms that can help them, you know, hey, you know, better look here. Uh, there is something strange. Um, and they can look and then, and then they can uh, connect with some other doctor. They have more experience, but there is that first screening that can help. Um, in uh, fostering the, the diagnosis of the patients coming. Um, one of the things that we know that right now in the, in the radiology, we see more and more images, more and more images and more use cases and so on. And that's a problem for majority of the doctors. You know, they are, they are, the eyes are getting very uh, uh, tired over the time. Uh, they have uh, not so many number of patients that they can process per day. Uh, and therefore, there's the, a big challenge for them. Um, so that's another case where we can look, right? This is an example of classification of the uh, microcirculation images from the septic or non septic patients. So when they, they come in the hospital, um, you can check if they have septicemia or not. Uh, and this was by using machine learning mode. I think it's an example from uh, Netherlands. Um, where, you know, they, they use uh, an algorithm and they, they have this... Um, uh, this device created where they run this algorithm to identify if you have, you know, uh, uh, septicemia or not. And therefore that is very good for triage and as well for, uh, um, for the care when you come in the hospital. And this is only up in just 20 seconds. <laughs> so uh, that's very fast. Um, another thing is the, the breast cancer uh, is well, you know, discussed and so on. Um, this is an example of using for uh, um, um, in, into the histopathology part uh, to try to identify uh, uh, the type of the of the cells, the cancer cells there, and classify them with uh, with a very good accuracy. So can be used as well to help the, the labs uh, processing uh, the the histo cases much faster and responds to the um, to the patients uh, with uh, faster response time. Mammography-based breast cancer screening, this is another thing that it's typically challenging, especially for the doctors that they don't have that much experience. So we see a track that, and there are very, and many, many articles and a lot of models published there for uh, in um, uh, using 3D net neural net, uh, nets models. Uh, where you can really detect those those kind of cases from MRI or for from CTs, so that's something we see as well. Another applicable case. So it's just a matter of uh, I would say the way you position this uh, kind of um, um, software and and into the healthcare and um, uh, the, um, the the regulations around it. Another case is the lung cancer detection. Uh, again, you can have an MRI and, and you can detect from, from there, you know, you know, that's in a normal lung or that has a pneumonia. Um, and this is proven very well. And even for COVID-19 was uh, still the same thing. You know, we have seen that even if we had a model trained <clears throat> to detect, for example, pneumonia uh, or bacteria or caused by the viruses, uh, you could really, you know, retrain that model with new images to detect COVID-19. So that's, that was something we have seen. Um, so another kind of use cases. Um, here is um, here's a use case that can be used in the, in the lab <clears throat> for classifying the blood cells uh, with high accuracy. So here's an example of, you know, uh, classifying monocyte, neutrophil, uh, lymphocyte, uh, very, very fast. Well, we say, well, um, if you have someone which is well-trained and so on, we'll always recognize. Yeah, more probably sure is like this the case, but they are, if they are rare, uh, blood cells uh, that typically doesn't have too much experience, right? Now the question is how fast we'll do it or if we miss something or not. So the system can be trained um, uh, with, you know, thousands of images to learn those things, right? And then precise. And here, one of the questions is, you know, how do I know that the, the, uh, the model, you know, is just, you know, give me an explanation in the decisions that is taking. And here you see an example on, on, on the right side, we actually create a histogram, sorry, a histogram, a, a new image where we show the, uh, like a heat map, we show the, the, why the model has choose to, to actually classify, for example, a particular image in a particular class. 
um, and where were the, the features that they contribute the most in the classification. And we can actually display that. Uh, and this is, if you search on the internet, it's, uh, it's called this model, uh, Google Class Activation Mapping. Um, but there are many others that can actually, you know, mask every layer and give you this perspective. Um, so that can, can, can give an explanation and actually can, you know, indicate to doctors, hey, you know, have a look here, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, last uh, but not least, um, I was mentioning about, you know, people coming always to the, to the emergency departments in the hospital. So one of the questions is you know, how you can do triage, right? So, you know, how you know which one is, you know, uh, really has to be treated immediately or someone can really wait for another 10 minutes or one hour or something like this. Um, and here is an example uh, that has been, uh, and, but now there are many as well. Uh, where you can actually create a model that can really predict with very high accuracy by just looking to the, and this is typically based on logistical regression with lasso regularization, um, or you can use the random forest, which is performing as well, great. Um, it's just using ambulance use, age, respiratory rate, uh, pulse rate, oxygen rates, st statistic blood pressure, and so on and so forth as features to actually detect the status of the, of the patients. And another thing you can consider here, say, okay, I'm kind of, you know, having this way, but just to protect the people, you know, that they are serving the community there to, to, to be healthy in, in case, you know, things are happening. Um, so we'll see all these things coming more often in upcoming years, I would say, as this kind of approach in the machine learning is more useful. And we have more data and historical data from, um, from the hospitals. Right, so this is what I had to say for today. Um, I thank you very much. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Florin, uh, thanks for, uh, for the detailed presentation about uh, the AI and where we are and uh, all the features, you know, whatever you talked about is all applicable these days. Thanks for your you know, time on this too. Um, panelists, any questions for Florin? And attendees also. If not, um, thank you very much, Ganesha, for inviting me and congratulations for this uh, webinar and this event from my side. And um, I wish you all the best and explore the world uh, and try to. Uh, create new things that can really help the humanity to progress. Thank you very much.